Good morning, West Side. Good morning. It is wonderful to see you this Sunday morning. I continue to be grateful for your presence and appreciate your tenacity of being here every Sunday you possibly can. Creating community has its challenges, but I found the challenges increase dramatically when people don't show up. <laughs> so thank you for showing up as much and as often as you possibly can. Connections are made slowly, as our responsive reading reminds us. It takes time, it takes effort to tend to something important enough to grow within us and between us. But the time and effort is often worth it because the connections can buttress us, can support us, can prop us up when things aren't going so well. We need the connections. <coughs> this past week for me has not gone well. Last Sunday I mentioned how I was not feeling my best. A couple of you said to me after the congregational meeting that it may actually get worse before it gets better. And I'm afraid to report those folks were right. This past week was rough. I've heard people say before, mostly in jest, that they felt so sick, so ill, that they just wished the good Lord would take them home. Well, thankfully, as bad as I felt last, this past week, I didn't feel that. <laughs> but it did remind me of a story I've told before, where three buddies were talking about death and dying. And one asked, when you're in your casket and friends and family are warning you, what would you like them to say about you? What would you like to hear? The first guy says, I'd like to hear them say that I was a great doctor of my time. <clears throat> and a great family man. The second man said, I would like to hear that I was a wonderful husband and school teacher who made a huge difference in our children of tomorrow. And the last guy says, I would like to hear them say, look, he's moving. <laughs> connections most easily while we are alive and while we are still moving. And I've begun to wonder if there is anything more important than our connections. What is this thing, this feeling that draws us together as people? These positive feelings, it seems to me, have the possibility of influencing our religious outlook and even our politics. Much of my time this past week was spent in bed or on the sofa in the living room, trying to read between naps, checking email occasionally, and going to the bathroom frequently with all of the fluids I was drinking. Sometimes I just had the television on for noise and I wound up watching the memorial service for Joe Paterno, the former college football coach at Penn State University. And many of you know college football is something I admittedly spend too much time following. It's a guilty pleasure I enjoy despite acknowledging it is not as pure as I wish it to be. And the money spent toward it these days by institutions of higher education is unjustifiable. I understand I can spend my time in more constructive ways, yet I watch anyway. <laughs> I'll not go into a lot of the detail about Paterno's memorial. If you've been following this in the news, you know there was a great deal going on with the way the man's career ended and his death only months later. But lying on my sofa, watching the emotions of the family, it was this connection, this sense 
of empathy that got to me. I have no idea what it means to be a paternal, but I know what it feels like when a loved one dies. I know the sense of loss, the grief that comes and hangs around, this grief that you wish would go away, but at the same time somehow realize it is a bond with the loved one that may pass as well. So I watched these people cry. I felt something similar and I cried too. Just imagining what those folks were going through, these people I didn't even know and had never met, influenced my emotions as well. We all do this to a greater or lesser degree, but we all do it. When I officiate a wedding, I will sometimes get caught up in the feelings flying around. I know this feeling of love and cherish it and appreciate it when I see it in others. When I officiate a memorial or a funeral, it's not so much that someone has died that gets to me, though that's often tragic or sad, but it is seeing the hurt and pain in the people who must continue to go on in life that gets to me the most. We all do this. We empathize. We put ourselves in the shoes, in the minds of another human being. And we know in our soul what that person is going through. Not always and certainly not perfectly, but close enough for us to emote in similar ways. Yes, we all do this. Watching movies, we do the same thing. There are feel-good movies which will elicit certain feelings that have us leave the theater with a lighter step in our walk. And there are tear-jerkers which bring forth the saline from our eyes. It matters not whether the story is of fact or fiction, what matters is our ability to connect, to empathize with the actors on the screen. In our society, those individuals with whom we can easily connect are paid vast sums of money, and we will fork over our own dough to sit in a room full of strangers, with all of their particularly odd movie watching and eating habits <laughs> in order to experience a connection with the actor on the movie screen. I can be emotional. And it used to be something which troubled me quite a bit to show my emotions publicly. But it doesn't bother me as much as it used to because I now see this as a connection. I've come to believe that empathy, that ability to understand and share the feelings of another, to feel for you, may actually be one of the most important things in the world. My connection to another, or their connection to me, or both when it's really working well, is something that we nurture rather than hinder. We feel for others. We imagine we feel with others. <coughs> Franz de Waal is a professor in the psychology department of Emory University in Atlanta. His latest book is titled The Age of Empathy. And he explains some things that further convince me how important empathy is and how it is a part of who we are. It is part of our makeup, our animal ancestry. He says, when our ancestors left the forest and entered an open, dangerous environment, they became prey and evolved a herd instinct that beats that of many other animals. We excel at bodily synchrony and actually derive pleasure from it. 
Walking next to someone, for example, we automatically fall into the same stride. We coordinate chants and waves during sporting events, oscillate together during pop concerts, and take aerobic classes where we all jump up and down at the same time. As an exercise, try to clap after a lecture when no one else is clapping, or try not to clap when everyone else is. We are group animals to a terrifying degree. He reminds us that in earlier times, empathy could be a matter of life and death, a matter of survival. In sub-zero cold, you either huddle together or die. And like Darwin, DeWall believes that cooperative groups of animals, which include us, will outperform less cooperative ones. He goes further when he says, in the domain of empathy and sympathy, evolution has created a standalone mechanism that works whether or not our direct interests are at stake. We are driven to empathize with others in an automated, often unconditional fashion. We genuinely care about others, wanting to see them happy and healthy, regardless of what immediate good this may do for us. We evolved to be this way because on average and in the long run, it served our ancestors. In his book, DeWall gives example after example of how non-human animals show empathy for one another, whether or not there appears to be any payoff which others have proclaimed must be present. But he also talks about human beings seem to for the most part, lack the killer instinct. For example, during World War II, only about one in five United States soldiers actually fired upon the enemy. In fact, squad leaders and platoon sergeants had to move up and down the firing line, kicking men to get them to shoot. There are those who can do the killing and who want to. That's for certain. But they are comparatively few in number and often require specialized training. Today, we do our killing much more often at a distance. A distance that is safe. Where we do not have to see the anguish, do not have to hear the screams, which will elicit an empathetic response. We feel for each other, even when we don't want to. Just this week, I received an email from a woman named Karen Dawn, she's an author, and it was sent to a lot of people, not just to me. But she talked about this sort of uh, pseudo-experiment conducted by NBC's Dateline some time ago. The show had an actor pretending to be hurt and crying out for help, and nearby two other actors were just hanging out and talking. In a candid camera type of situation, Dateline watched the reactions of people walking by. Almost every person, as they saw two others ignore the cries for help, just kept walking. One person in 20 stopped and then called for more help. But the email goes on to say, here's the good part. Once one person stopped, every person who came into the situation afterward also stopped and was willing to get involved the experiment seemed to show that once one person acts from an empathetic response, that others will follow. When one is willing to speak the word, others will listen. But we must be willing to take a stand and speak it in a way that others will hear. The problem, Karen Dawn says, is not that we don't have enough love, that we sometimes don't have enough empathy, the problem is that we are sometimes whispering our love. 
Empathy is important. It is vastly important. When you begin to look for it, you see it everywhere. When you understand its necessity, you practice it more. And then you notice it most when it is absent. In the Dalai Lama's most recent book, which is called Beyond Religion, he says, it is clear that something is seriously lacking in the way we humans are going about things. But what is it that we lack? The fundamental problem, I believe, is that at every level, we are giving too much attention to the external material aspects of life while neglecting moral ethics and inner values. The Dalai Lama says, by inner values, I mean the qualities that we all appreciate in others and towards which we all have a natural instinct bequeathed by our biological nature as animals that survive and thrive only in an environment of concern, affection, and warm-heartedness, or in a single word, compassion. And my friends, when you look up the word compassion in your thesaurus, what word do you think you find there as a synonym? You will indeed find the word empathy. The Dalai Lama, Karen Dawn, and Franz DeWall are all saying the very same thing. There's a funny one letter I heard in graduate school studying counseling, which is really, like the ministry, a professionalized version of empathy. It goes like this. It says, everyone says I lack empathy, but I couldn't care less. <laughs> but we do care. You and I care. This past week, I had to cancel a lot of meetings, a lot of visits I would have rather made, things I wanted to do but couldn't. Each time, whether it was a West Sider or a friend or a colleague or a family member, all of them were kind and considerate and generous. They knew what it was like not to feel well and genuinely wanted me to feel better. They were saying, I feel for you. I empathize with you. Take care of yourself. Unitarian Universalism and Westside are the context within which I practice my empathy, my compassion, my love. I'm proud to say there are plenty of times in our religious history where we have been like that person in the divine experience who stopped to let others know there was a problem. Perhaps it's this way for you too. When we take on causes, when we march, it is because of our empathy. When we collect donations, it's because of our empathy. When we celebrate our joys, when we share each other's sorrows, it is because of our empathy. When we say, let us go in peace, believe in peace, and create. Empathy is there. When we say love is the doctrine of this church, empathy is there. Do not whisper your love, but actively look for places to practice your empathy in your home, in your work, in your world, and of course, in your church. That's what we want to have our best, I think. We're much less likely to become angry. We're much less likely to demand our own way. We're much less likely to say something we will regret by simply putting ourselves in the shoes of another and letting the empathy flow. It's bred into us. In fact, we must choose to turn it off. But I think our life I think our faith, 
is better served when we allow our empathy to burst forth. We then recognize in others what we ourselves yearn for when we say, whether out loud or to ourselves, As we rise and body our spirit to join together and sing our closing hymn number 148, let freedom stand for you as well. <laughs> 